Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. The Radio and TV News Endowment, a fund established by listeners and viewers to sustain reporting of Indiana news. More information at indianapublicmedia.org slash support. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The state's Attorney General Curtis Hill is facing allegations of inappropriately touching four women. Our State House reporter joins us to talk about the groping investigation and lawmakers' reactions. This community is being designed especially with teachers in mind. The homes are supposed to be affordable on a teacher's salary. I want educators to live there, but I haven't heard a single educator that has looked at it. Ahead why teachers aren't flocking to live in Indianapolis's new Educators Village. And we travel to Madison, Indiana, where the community is gearing up for a high-speed boat race that brings thousands to town. It's been a tradition for decades, but the regatta's future is in jeopardy. It's a huge economic driver for the community, so we certainly want to do our part and make sure the festival exists. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Democrats are calling on a rising star in the Indiana Republican Party to resign. Attorney General Curtis Hill has been accused of groping four women, three legislative staffers, and a lawmaker at a post-session party in March. Activists are planning a weekend march to call for Hill to resign. While Governor Eric Holcomb, Speaker of the House Brian Bosma, and David Long, President Pro Tem of the Senate, have all called for Hill to resign. Hill has said he has no plans to do so. He has called an inquiry into the matter a prejudicial investigation that is deeply troubling. Brandon Smith joins us now from the State House to talk more about this. So, Brandon, now just this morning, State Representative Marla Kendall Aria Reardon came out and said she was groped by Hill at a party earlier this year. Is having a victim come out publicly, does that put greater pressure on Hill? Well, first things first, it's important whether they come out publicly or not that we always listen to and believe accusers in these sorts of situations. And of course, coming out publicly adds a special sort of bravery to it because in the history of these sorts of accusations, they tend to go better for the accused uh, than the accusers. But in this case, she's come out after all of these other people, including the leader of the Republican Party, the leader of the state government, Governor Eric Holcomb, the legislative leaders, uh, now a member of Congress, Susan Brooks has joined those calls, as, as has Joe Donnelly. Um, I'm not sure how much more pressure that can add at this point, but it certainly doesn't hurt. As you mentioned, the governor, leaders at the State House on both, aisles, on both sides of the aisle, they're calling for Hill to resign. But if he doesn't, is there any way for them to just remove him from office? There is a procedure under which state officers like Attorney General Curtis Hill can be impeached or removed from office by the legislature. The House would have to bring the articles of impeachment by a two-thirds vote, the Senate would have to convict by a two-thirds vote, or both chambers can pass a joint resolution each by two-thirds vote. But only one person so far, Democratic Representative Ed Delaney, has threatened to bring those articles of impeachment. Um, there hasn't really been much more discussion of that, but there is an avenue for that to happen. Brandon, we also heard today the state inspector general is looking into the matter. How long will that take and what could come from that investigation? I can't speak to the length of that investigation. There's really not a good way to know that at this point. As to the consequences of that, they aren't 
excessively severe from a criminal uh, perspective, because that's not what kind of investigation this is. We could see fine, uh, a fine of, of Curtis Hill if there's wrongdoing found, or we could see him barred from, from working for the state uh, for a length of time or for forever. Um, but beyond that, there isn't much the inspector general can do, especially if he leaves office. Okay, Brennan, we'll stay tuned. Thank you very much. The Educators Village in Indianapolis is marketed as affordable teacher housing, and we profiled the project last November when crews started construction. But the Educators Village has an income cap, and some teacher salaries at Indianapolis Public Schools put them just outside of that range. Jeannie Lindsay reports on that and other challenges officials are working to overcome. Sabbath McKiernan Allen teaches at Thomas Gregg Elementary School on the near east side of Indianapolis. She's been at the school for a few years, all the while sharing a house with roommates. When she heard about the Educators Village, formerly known as the Teachers Village, she started to consider buying a house. It met all of her criteria, somewhere close to work, somewhere walkable, most importantly, somewhere she could afford. Um, I wanted to live in a kind of a, where there's a lot of younger people. Um, but price definitely dictated it. When McKiernan Allen inquired about the homes, she was surprised. Her salary meant she didn't qualify for the home in her budget. So I got a call that said that the house would be like 170 to 180, and that's just way out of my price range. With her realtor's help, McKiernan Allen resumed her search. She ended up here, about three miles from the educator's village, and her new house cost about $10,000 less than the village home she initially wanted to buy. A group called Near East Area Renewal, or NEAR, heads the village project. The income cap was out of their control. The Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development sets those limits. Executive Director John Franklin Hay says it was frustrating because his hands were tied. But then just last month, HUD coincidentally reevaluated its caps. So we reached back out to them to let them know that they income qualify or potentially income qualify at, at $43,000 if that's where they are. But challenges go beyond income requirements. We've had no one, none of the organizations, none, none, of, the, none of the charter schools and, and not IPS, um, no one has offered teachers an incentive uh, to purchase these homes at this point. I'm a little disappointed in that. The slow start could be attributed to bad timing. IPS closed a few high schools earlier this year and has a crucial school funding measure up for consideration in November. Right now, the district faces a multi-million dollar budget deficit. What is the Hay says outreach has interested plenty of people. One teacher recently bought a house, and two others are going through the process. An open house last week attracted a crowd of other potential buyers to look at finished houses and some still in the works. But not all of them were the target audience. All of these houses are available to anyone who income qualifies. Hay says a major goal is to use the village as part of a retention strategy for schools in the area. But when it comes to the buzz in her school, teacher McKiernan Allen isn't sure when it might catch on. She thinks some prospective buyers lost interest because of the early income caps. I want educators to live there, but I haven't heard a single educator that has looked at it. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Jeannie Lindsay. Construction on the rest of the village homes is scheduled to wrap up later this year. Hay says road construction in the village will start in early 2019. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Former Notre Dame law professor Judge Amy Coney Barrett is one of three finalists for Justice Anthony Kennedy's soon-to-be-vacant Supreme Court seat. Barrett is a well-known conservative. President Trump appointed her to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals last year. She has written in legal journals about a flexible or soft interpretation of adhering to legal precedent. Trump is expected to announce his pick for the seat on Monday. 
Statues of Mary, Joseph, and the baby Jesus are caged in a cage topped with barbed wire outside the Christchurch Cathedral in Indianapolis. The display is in protest of the Trump administration's zero tolerance immigration policy. Church officials say the Holy Family was homeless and that the Bible says we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. President Donald Trump recently stopped the separation of families detained at the border, but the process of reuniting them is proving difficult. Dancing is not a crime. That's the message Terre Haute City leaders are trying to send by revising a controversial ordinance that required permits for public dances. Now the rules will apply to all public special events. The City Council adopted a controversial rule in 2016 that required a permit for any dance open to the public within Terre Haute. But after resident complaints about the language being too broad and confusing, a committee reworked the rules. The council adopted the changes Thursday night, which mean a $50 permit will be required for most special events. If you're going to have an event that's open to the public, where there is a public need for safety, uh, then at least check and see if you need it. The changes also reduce the amount of liability insurance required for those hosting special events to $1 million. But resident Tommy Williams says he doesn't think the changes address his concerns. Police cited him for not having a permit to host his birthday party, which they say was open to the public and included a DJ. Williams challenged the citation in city court and lost. He worries changes to the ordinance still don't make the permitting process clear. They still want you to go get a permit. Why should we have to pay for a permit when you're just having a good time with your family? But council members say the rules don't apply to private parties. They say the ordinance is necessary because of issues the city had with several college parties before they adopted the rules. Prior to that, we had a series of events in a fairly short period of time, which had been really problematic for the community, which resulted in people uh, being harmed or with gunshots being taken at events. Crossan says those dangerous incidents have been rare since police started enforcing the dance permits. Residents can call the Terre Haute Legal Department for guidance on whether their event requires a permit. State health officials say Hoosiers shouldn't be alarmed that the first human swine flu case in the country this year was contracted in Indiana. The State Department of Health says the victim likely got the flu after visiting a county fair. Officials say trips to the fair are safe, but they recommend not eating or drinking and taking extra precautions within the pig barn. Don't take your pacifiers and your sippy cups or your strollers into a barn. Um, the five second rule does not apply. She says they've seen a few cases since 2012 and Hoosiers shouldn't be too worried. Symptoms of swine flu include sneezing, breathing, problems and fever. But they may not show up right away. The State Department of Health is advising summer fair visitors to wash their hands and avoid eating or drinking while in pig barns. Water use across the country is at its lowest level since the 1960s. That's according to a new report by the U.S. Geological Survey. In Indiana alone, thermoelectric power from sources like coal went down about 20% from 2010 to 2015. All but one of the state's coal power plants has decreased its output in the past five years. Still, in 2015, Indiana withdrew the most water for industrial uses of any state in the country. It takes a lot of water to make cars, medical devices, and drugs. Indiana created a water infrastructure task force to research its water needs earlier this year, but hasn't approved any funding to support the task force. A group of lawmakers and environmentalists say they oppose the EPA's plans to change clean car standards. The standards require new cars and light trucks built after 2025 to get about 50 miles to the gallon. EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt announced in April that the agency would consider undoing the Obama-era standards. Not only are we going to see a spike in gas prices, but we're also going to see more pollution in communities of color. According to the Union of Concerned Scientists, transportation is the largest single source of air pollution in the United States. The EPA is expected to come out with a proposal to roll back clean car standards soon. 
Bloomington's most iconic street could see significant changes if the city adopts a new transportation plan. One of the recommendations included in a new report is turning Kirkwood Avenue into what's called a shared street. The proposal would still allow vehicle traffic and parking, but would be geared toward pedestrians. The recommendations are the result of a study that was conducted to assess the city's transportation needs. The public can weigh in on the recommendations at a meeting next Thursday at Bloomington City. Hall. The future of the Brown County Playhouse is in jeopardy. Indiana University used to own the Brown County Playhouse, but closed the facility in 2010. The city raised money to reopen the property, but it struggled to turn a profit despite increasing ticket sales. Playhouse this size, you really need about 40 to 50 percent donations. Uh, on grants last year, we were down to about 12 percent. Curlin says similar event spaces rely on donations to stay open. He hopes other local businesses that benefit from the Playhouse will offer their support. Scientists say they've discovered a new species of spider in a southern Indiana cave. It's being called Ilandiana luisi. It's the first new spider in its genus to be found in more than 30 years. Arachnocologist Mark Milne named the tiny pale colored sheet weaving spider after his colleague Julian Lewis, who clued him into the spider's existence. That's especially these sheet web weavers that we're talking about, it's very unusual, it's very normal for um, some of these spiders not to get looked at or recorded or collected or studied in decades. The two millimeter long spider was found in the Stygian River Cave, which Milne says could be the only place it can be found. He says the fact the spider has lost much of its pigment but still has eyes means it's been in the cave for a long time, but not that long in evolutionary terms. I would not want to find one of those oh in my, my house, so I'm glad it's only in a cave for now. Now, you know, I read where spiders are a form of pest control for your house. I, I don't so know. So that wouldn't be a bad thing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Attendance at the Madison Regatta has been declining for years, but community members hope changes will return the famous boat race to its former glory. Two survivors of a Noblesville school shooting got a standing ovation this week at their community's 4th of July parade. A look at the community's show of support coming up. And we'll have much more from across the state right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Retailers are scrambling to meet new requirements for how CBD must be labeled. CBD has been legal in Indiana since March, but now it's required to come with a QR code. It's a type of barcode that can be scanned by a smartphone, which will give you information about the product. As Tyler Lake reports, the law is meant to help consumers and law enforcement. If you want to find out more about the CBD oil you're buying in Indiana, it's this easy. Once you've scanned the QR code, you'll find information about the product, including an independent lab analysis, ingredients, expiration date, and even the batch number. The law that went into effect July 1st requires retailers to attach tags and stickers to every product they sell containing CBD. Yes, yeah, so thankfully we've been able to work with our specific vendors and they've been sending us the codes and stuff like that to put our products. As we do have a couple of products that we're still working the codes out with and that's why we have some couple of empty spaces and stuff like that. One thing the new regulations haven't done is hurt the booming sales of CBD oil. It's extremely popular, so the most questions and the most 
customer flow is definitely in that department. Buckner says some manufacturers are building the QR codes into their labels. She thinks it won't take long until all CBD products will come with the scannable codes, so store employees will no longer have to apply them manually. But retailers who fail to comply with the new stickering law could face up to $10,000 in fines and could lose their retail license. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. Another law that took effect July 1st makes it illegal to have colored headlights on your vehicle. The law stipulates Indiana drivers can only have white and amber lights on the front of their vehicles. The law also requires taillights to be only red or amber. At Crandall Custom Concepts in Bloomington, people have been coming in with lots of questions about the new regulations. We're, they're, they're not sweating it just yet, but I also don't think anybody really knows how hard and heavy they're going to hit us on these things. When they passed the restrictions, lawmakers said it was for safety reasons. Fines for violating the law can start at about $135. Organizers are hoping changes to the Madison Regatta this year will ensure the decades-old boat race has a future. The annual event draws thousands of people to the small town on the Ohio River's banks. But the Regatta is several thousand dollars in debt following years of bad weather and declining attendance. Not many now, many are worried about whether the race is sustainable. As Barbara Brozier reports, its survival is vital to the community. When you step into the back room at David Johnson's boat shop, it's like stepping into a museum. Just everything means something to me. There isn't an empty space on the wall. Boat racing's always been my coup de gras, you might say. He's collected decades of memorabilia from the Madison Regatta. That's one of my favorites. If you haven't heard of the race, you're definitely not from here. It just represents a lot of lives here in Madison, Indiana. Boat racing in Madison dates all the way back to 1911, but the current Indiana Governor's Cup unlimited hydroplane race started in 1951. The unlimiteds at that time were powered by World War II aircraft engines. The race is such a big deal here, the city even owns a boat that competes. It's fondly called Miss Madison, but these days it's decked out in sponsorship logos. It's one of several changes that's occurred over the years as the regattas become less financially stable. The uh, attendance usually would be about 30,000 people in the early 60s. By 1971, when Madison hosted the Gold Cup race for the very first time, uh, we drew about 100,000 people. But since then, the crowds have somewhat declined. That worries many people in Madison because they depend on the regatta to attract tourists. Organizers say it brings about $1 million into the local economy in just one weekend. The regatta brings people into town that normally wouldn't come, obviously, and they're, you know, they're going to shop at our stores, they're going to eat at our restaurants. Changes are coming to the event in an effort to preserve and ideally boost attendance. This year, the regatta is offering tickets online for the first time, and organizers are adding a full-fledged music festival to try and appeal to younger crowds. So what we're hoping to do is, is cross over. You know, we're hoping that boat fans become music fans and music fans become boat fans. And, and really, what we're trying to do is just make sure that we have a lasting event and, and we needed to reinvent ourselves. Because what drew people here in the first place may no longer be enough to sustain the regatta. This is the 68th year and um, you have to always constantly review what you're doing and change and adjust because, you know, the level of interest of, of, a, of a really old sport is, you know, has gone down. But we're, we're wanting to help bring that back and get um, younger generations and, um, involved and get them interested in the sport and make new traditions. But for many people in Madison, the boat race's survival is about more than just money. I saw my first race in 1959, okay, I was seven years old, and uh, it's, it uh, got into my blood then. It has been uh, very thick in my blood since then. In the summertime, that's all you heard about. I, I remember when I was a kid, we had our bicycles, and you get around regatta time, you, uh, you chiseled out or cut out a little hydroplane and pulled it along the back of your bicycle. Boat racing is Madison, Indiana. You speak of Madison, Indiana, you know about the movie, you know about the Miss Madison 71 that won the Gold Cup, the Cinderella story. Johnson hopes to add new memories to that list. Believe it or not, he still has some room for more buttons and photos. Like the city of Madison, the regatta is part of his history. It's like a lifeline, you know, it's like two pieces together. So 
I think it's just important that it has to go on. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. The music festival kicks off tonight. Hydroplane races start at 11 tomorrow morning and continue through Sunday. And the student and teacher who were shot at a Noblesville school received a standing ovation this week when they appeared as the Grand Marshals in the town's 4th of July parade. It was 13-year-old Ella Whistler's first public appearance. She wore a neck brace and waved to the crowd. She was shot seven times when a male student entered the science classroom at Noblesville West Middle School and began shooting. Teacher Jason Seaman was shot as he tackled the shooter. Uh, it was a terrible situation, but he, he turned it into something that is uh, obviously better. So uh, he gives the community something, someone uh, to cheer for, and he's kind of a symbol of like the Miller, Miller Nation. The event drew a number of local and state officials who praised the two Grand Marshals for their courage. The teen charged in the May 25th shooting is scheduled to appear in court in September. We're not naming him because he's a juvenile. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. The Radio and TV News Endowment, a fund established by listeners and viewers to sustain reporting of Indiana news. More information at indianapublicmedia.org slash support. And by WTIU members. Thank you.